All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is Adnan Darwish, and I'll be talking about our work on necessary and sufficient explanations. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Chunji G. And this talk is uh, actually about classifiers and explaining the decisions made uh, by classifiers. Um, we have an instance, uh, let's say a loan application, and the application gets declined. And we're interested in two kinds of questions. Uh, the first one is, why did you make that decision? Why did you decline this applicant? And the uh, second question is, what would it take to change the decision to get this uh, applicant to be uh, granted uh, a law? And we'll find that the first question is related to the notion of uh, sufficient reasons, and the second one is related to the notion of necessary reasons behind a decision, which we will talk about. But let me first say that there's a lot of results in this paper, and they are applied broadly, uh, but you'll see me talk a lot about uh, decision graphs in particular. Now, this is of its own interest because decision graphs and trees, important types of classifiers, they can learn, but we can also compile these decision graphs from other types of machine learning classifiers, for example, uh, Bayesian network classifiers. And in fact, there is a whole line of work on compiling various machine learning classifiers into decision graphs, symbolic decision graphs. So when we're able to explain decision graphs, we're able to explain these other classifiers as well through this compilation process. Am I going to talk about this compilation process? That's another subject, but I will motivate these two questions that we're interested in further using this particular classifier for admission into a program uh, based on four features, SAT score, uh, GPA, and the quality of the essay and the interview of the applicant. Let's suppose we have this instance, this applicant, they got this much on their uh, SAT score, uh, their GPA is medium, both their essay and interview uh, failed, they failed on those. So the decision is rejected. And now we want to know uh, why was this person rejected according to this classifier? And here where the notion of a sufficient reason comes in, and it's a minimal subset of the instance that guarantees the decision. So in this case, we have actually uh, two of these uh, sufficient reasons. The first one uh, basically says if the SAD GPA and interview, this is the reason why applicant was rejected. It's basically saying the essay didn't matter. So it, even if that person passed the uh, essay that they will be rejected. Uh, that sufficient reason is not surprising given how the graph classified the instance. But the second one is more interesting. The second one says it is because the, the person failed their interview and essay. That means it doesn't matter uh, what SAT score they have or what GPA they would have as given that they actually uh, failed uh, on the interview and the essay, they will be declined. Now we go to the second question, how do we change the decision? So we're talking about the same instance now, the same decision, and what would it take to get this applicant to be admitted? And uh, this is where the notion of a necessary reason comes in. And we have three of them in this case. Uh, each one of these is a minimal subset of the instance that if you change, you are guaranteed to change the decision. Now, if you look at the first one, it says the interview. The person failed on the interview. So if they were to pass the interview, guaranteed, they will be admitted. Now, the second one refers to SAT score and essay. And it says if that person had uh, greater than or equal 1450 and passed the essay, guaranteed, they would be admitted. Now, the last one is, is interesting because uh, the GPA is multi-valued variable. So there's two ways in which I can change this. One of them would lead to changing the decision. The other does not. So you're guaranteed that there is a change of these that would change the decision, but not that all possible changes to these variables would do that. And again, these sets are minimal. Now, a central notion to the approach that uh, we develop in this paper is this notion of a complete reason behind the decision, which is something that's a little bit more general than necessary and sufficient reasons. And we use it actually to compute these sufficient and necessary reasons. So given a classifier and an instance, this is a Boolean formula. In this case, it's expressed as a circuit. It's called the complete reason. It was introduced in 2020 in ECI. And the idea is, if you have the complete reason behind the decision, then you can compute the sufficient reasons by computing the prime implicants of the complete reason. All right, prime implicants have been around for a very long time in computer science. I'm not going to explain them, but you'll find an explanation in the paper. And up to this point, actually, this is, this is known stuff. And what we show in this paper 
is that if you compute the prime implicates of the complete reason, then those would be the uh, necessary reasons. So once you have the complete reason, you can use it to compute either sufficient or necessary. So let's look now at the big picture again so that we highlight what's new in, in this uh, work and, and the contribution. So we have the classifier. If we want to prepare uh, to do these computations that we mentioned, complete reason, sufficient, and necessary, the first thing you do is compute what we call class formulas. So this classifier has K classes. And uh, we will talk about class formulas in just a little bit, but these are formulas one per class, which characterize, each formula characterize the instances in that particular class. Now you have this, and now you get an instance, and a decision is made. CI is the decision on it, and you want to explain it. So you take the corresponding class formula and the instance and compute the complete reason. Now you're ready to do explanations. Uh, why did you make this decision? Uh, what would it take to change this decision? This picture, except for the necessary reasons computed in this particular way, ha has been around and has been instantiated. So what's new here? What's new is a number of things. One uh, is that we have now a, a native treatment of this framework uh, for handling discrete variables and multi-classes. Previously, when we had multi-valued variables, we would have to binarize them. And that's problematic, as we'll see later. Uh, when you're dealing, for example, with decision trees, random forests, these di discrete variables end up being uh, the result of discretizing continuous variables. You may have thousands and tens of thousands of values per variable. Uh, if you binarize, it's a problem. So now we have a native formulation in terms of discrete variables. We have a new way of computing complete reasons, particularly for uh, discrete variables based on the notion of quantification. We will discuss this. We also have closed forms for the complete reason for a certain number of classifiers, and that includes decision graphs, decision trees, sentential decision diagrams. So you don't even have to go through a class formula directly from the classifier and the instance. Um, you can get a closed form for the complete reason and, and in linear time space, a substantial portion of the paper is dedicated to the notion of necessary reasons. Now, as I'll mention later, these do correspond to what is known as contrastive explanations in the literature. I'll say a little bit more about this, but we added more results on that. And the uh, final portions are two algorithms, one for computing the shortest necessary reasons. Now, one of the issues with the, uh, sufficient and complete reasons is there could be an exponential number of them. And one way to focus uh, is to pick those that are shortest in length. So instead of finding subset minimal ones, you find uh, length minimal ones. And interestingly enough, the algorithm ends up being out of polynomials. We have also an algorithm for computing the shortest sufficient reasons. It's a best effort algorithm, but looks quite effective in practice. Uh, the reason it's a best effort algorithm because probably this is a hard task. It can be hard to even find one single uh, short sufficient reason as we discussed in the paper. All right, so now there's so many results in this paper and their scope and broader applicability uh, vary. Uh, so you'd have to check the paper to see where these results apply, what kind of classes of classifiers. But I will say that these two algorithms in particular uh, apply for any complete reason that happens to be in a form known as monotone or, or, or decomposable, which is pretty broad as you will see in the uh, paper. Now, before I move on, a couple of words on terminology. Sufficient reasons, as I discussed them, and this is the term used in this EKI paper uh, from 2020 when the notion of a complete reason was introduced first. Uh, these correspond to what has been known as PI explanations. So they were first introduced in 2018 uh, and later also referred to as abductive explanations. Uh, so all of these three things, sufficient reason, PI explanations, abductive explanations, same thing. Uh, again, originating in 2018. Now, necessary reasons, as we define them in this paper, uh, that is the prime implicates of the complete reason end up corresponding to what people have studied under the name of contrastive explanations. We show the correspondence in the paper. Uh, this has even a longer tradition, contrastive explanations going back to the 19th 1990s, but uh, the uh, formulation we use is by uh, Ignatiev and colleagues uh, because they formalized this notion while it was discussed more generally before. And the correspondence we show is to that particular notion. And in fact, due to this correspondence, you immediately you, you get results back and forth between the two notions. We prove new properties about uh, necessary reasons, as you see in the paper, which apply to 
got lots of explanations because they correspond to each other. Now, there's also another notion known as counterfactual explanations, which is very, very similar, but not exactly the same precisely. So what we define as necessary reasons being prime implicates of complete reasons end up corresponding precisely to contrastive explanations as you will see in the paper. Okay, let's get moving. We need to highlight some of the key technical ideas in the paper or what it rests on. So we mentioned this notion of a class formula. This is a very important notion. So let's say you have a classifier here, in this case, a decision graph over three variables, they're ternary. And this classifier has three classes, C1, C2, C3. Each class has a formula. And here they are in this case. Uh, what these are, what we call discrete formulas, formulas over discrete variables. And each one of them captures or characterizes all of the instances in that class. So delta one captures the instances that are labeled with class one. If uh, instance satisfy this formula, it is in this class. If it does not, it's not in this class and so on. And these three formulas, are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Uh, they are an abstract representation of the classifier, and this is what we work with. Uh, such class formulas are easy to obtain for a number of classifiers, decision trees, decision graphs, SDDs, and so on. These uh, class formulas are very easy to obtain. Now, how do we compute complete reasons? Uh, when this was originally uh, introduced the notion of complete reason, there was a dedicated algorithm for that, uh, and it required a particular type of classifier. So now we do it a little more generally based on your results that I'll point you to. But here's an example. You have a classifier over three variables x, y, z, ternary. Let's say this one has four classes, and therefore four class formulas, delta one through delta four. Now we get an instance, and this instance says uh, x is two, y is two, and z is one and it's classified as C2, that's the class. So the corresponding class formula in this case happens to be the following. Now I want the complete reason. And the idea is from the instance and the class formula, I can get that. And the way you get it is using quantification. This is the new re results that I'll point you to in a little bit that we're basing uh, this paper on. Uh, what happened here is you take this class formula delta two and universally quantify the three literals that define the instance. Now, what does that mean? We'll mention in a second. But if you do that computation, which is purely logical computation, uh, you get this result. That's the complete reason in blue. And what this is saying is you can think of it as the most general condition that characterizes why the instance was uh, classified as C2. It's basically saying that the reason why this instance was classified as C2 because the, the instance had the characteristic X2 and it had one of the other two characteristics, Y2 and C1. Now, this ability to compute complete reasons uh, through quantification was actually introduced in this recent paper, uh, journal paper in JER. But uh, this paper actually started this uh, using Boolean variables, and it was all in Boolean logic. And towards the end of the paper, in the conclusion section actually said, this can also be applied to discrete variables. And here's the definition of quantification in that case. Uh, but that, that was it. It was just the definition. So what we did in this paper, we took this definition and developed results around it. So we studied it like the JER paper studied the Boolean case. A number of results just parallel the ones in the Boolean case, so they're not surprising, but then a number of, uh, of results were actually novel and were needed for what we needed to do in this paper. But it's just a beautiful formulation in which once you have the class formulas expressed as discrete formulas, you can get the uh, complete reason through this quantification procedure and it has all kind of properties and when it can be computed easily. Uh, and so on. Now, let me stress again the importance of working with discrete variables in, in natively as opposed to reduction to Boolean variables. I already mentioned, uh, when you have things like decision graphs or random uh, decision trees or random forests, um, you have numeric attributes, but uh, this gets dis discretized. So uh, you can see that uh, pattern with, even though it's continuous variable, we can discrete discretize it into a number of equivalence intervals. And then we treat each one of these interval as a discrete state. So uh, yes, you see numbers in this uh, uh, red box, 
but each interval can be viewed as a symbolic state. Uh, the numbers inside each interval do not matter. They're all the same as far as the classifier is concerned. We saw examples, especially when you have random forests, where uh, you could have a variable, a continuous variable that's when discretized, will have tens of thousands and reaching up to 100,000 values. Because if you have, let's say, 100 uh, uh, decision trees, each one of them end up using its own thresholds. So uh, the, it's very important to treat this natively as opposed to binarizing. You binarize a variable that has 100,000 values, will, you'll end up introducing 100,000 million variables. You don't want to do that. So this is one of the main attractions of the formulation that's in this work. Okay, let's go back to the big picture and try to wrap up with a few more slides. This was the big picture. And what's new here and what I'm going to do next is just quickly uh, mention the two algorithms for computing shortest and necessary and sufficient uh, reasons and we'll leave it at that. So the algorithm for computing shortest necessary reasons, it's actually pretty simple. Uh, as mentioned, it applies to any complete reason that is in the form of a monotone and or decomposable NNF. You can see the definitions of those in the paper. Uh, here's an example of a uh, complete reason. We saw this one before. This is a monotone and or decomposable N and F. Now, as mentioned earlier, if you compute the prime implicates of this circuit, uh, you, you get necessary reasons. Now, what this algorithm does, it first prunes the circuit. And what does pruning mean? It, it kills some edges using uh, uh, linear paths, details in the paper. Once you prune it by deleting some of the edges, if you go and compute the prime implicates of the pruned NNF, you get the shortest prime implicates. That is, you get the shortest necessary reasons. And that's what this algorithm does. The Zudu code is almost the same as the real code in terms of size. And interestingly enough, this turns out to be an output polynomial. Uh, algorithm, so which is uh, fantastic. Uh, the other algorithm for shortest sufficient reasons, a little bit more involved. And as I said, this is the best uh, effort algorithm because uh, this is a hard task as shown in the paper, uh, but it has a very simple structure as well. Uh, what it does is based on the following insight. So I, I wanna compute the shortest sufficient reasons. I don't know the length of those. So the shortest sufficient reasons could have seven characteristics in them. So what I do is I set K to zero and, and go search for uh, implicants of the circuit that have that length. If I find them, I'm done. If not, I increase K by one and then repeat the process. So if I get to K equals five and I'm searching for implicants of length five, that means I already know there is no implicants of length zero, one, two, three, and four. And because now I'm searching under these conditions, I can do a lot of pruning. So there's some sophisticated pruning techniques uh, that's done uh, by this algorithm. And as you'll see next, uh, they ought to be pretty effective. So I'll conclude with some empirical results. Uh, this is a, a suite of decision trees and decision graphs. Uh, the decision trees have been learned by Weka from uh, data. The decision graphs were compiled from Bayesian networks. And you can see some of them actually have a uh, few million nodes in them. And what we're comparing here is in the red are the new algorithm I just discussed. And in the blue are algorithms that compute the uh, sufficient or necessary reason, not the shortest ones. And as you can see, uh, the new algorithm is very efficient, really in time in the milliseconds. Um, Things like this are timeouts. So you can see that if you do not insist on computing the shortest uh, reasons, but just reasons, uh, you can actually, uh, there's a lot of timeouts. But when you focus on the shortest ones, you can actually uh, do a lot better. All right, so I'm, I'm done here. I'll just conclude with a few remarks. I think the, the, the most important part of this work is uh, there is now a, pretty integrated in the comparative theory of complete, sufficient, and necessary reasons with native handling of discrete variables and multi-classes, no binarization. Very important, practically. We have algorithms for computing sufficient reasons and necessary ones, the shortest ones, as you, you saw, and uh, embodied in the paper or, uh, is a study of universal literal quantification for discrete formulas following the work by Darwish and, and, and Marquis, 
which did an extensive study for the Boolean case. And uh, you'll see that the tools that were developed in this paper to achieve the results that we mentioned are more broadly applicable. They have actually quite a bit of theoretical and practical applications. Um, this is all. Thank you very much.